Charlie Gersbach, the Rooney Family Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering. Since coming to Duke in 2009, Charlie has been at the forefront of our explorations of the human genome, helping us to better understand who we are as people and how we can overcome disease and injury. But I will let him explain that to you. Please join me in welcoming Charlie Gersbach. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you all for your time tonight. I'm, I'm really incredibly excited to be here and tell you about this tremendous opportunity that we have at Duke to use the technology that we've developed to realize the promise of the genomic revolution. So the genomic revolution began about 20 years ago with the Human Genome Project, and so the goal was to deliver the first draft sequence of the human genome. Ultimately, this project cost $3 billion, and, and it did deliver us the first draft sequence, and this was with the promise that the sequence of the human genome was going to reveal the mystery of human disease and provide new treatments for most, if not all, of different human diseases. And while undoubtedly genetics and genomics has come a long way facilitated by the sequencing of the human genome and the Human Genome Project, I think that um, it's fair to ask why is it that so many of the most common and most devastating human diseases um, are still untreatable in, in many cases, despite all of this uh, revolution in the genomics area. And, and we at Duke, we have, a, we have a hypothesis for that, and that's we've been looking in the wrong place. So many of you are probably familiar with some version of this cartoon. And this is the idea of the, uh, the man who's looking for the keys under the lamppost. And so uh, the policeman comes along, or he's looking for his quarter in this case under the lamppost. And the policeman comes along and says, did you drop your, your quarter here? And he says, no, I dropped it a couple blocks down the road. And he says, well, why are you looking for it here? And it says, well, this is where the light is better under the lamppost. And this is a, a great allegory for how the field of genetics and genomics has been working for the last 20 years. They've been looking where the light is best. And so where is the light best in the genome? Well, the light is best where the genes are. We know what genes look like, we know what genes do, and we know how to study genes. However, only 2% of our genome encodes for about these 20,000 genes that we're so good at, at working with. However, many of you might be surprised to know, I know I was surprised when I heard that there's actually about 6,000 of these 20,000 genes, about a third of our genes, we actually don't know what they do. And so it's, it's a great question. Why is it that these 6,000 genes, we have no idea what they do, and, and how might understanding what these genes do better enable us to treat diseases that we really don't understand, like Alzheimer's disease and, and schizophrenia? And, and so it was a mystery to me why we didn't really understand these genes. And a really interesting study came out last fall. And it was even, it was published in the scientific literature, but highlighted uh, widespread in the popular press, like the New York Times. And it did this study of why is it that we don't understand what many of our genes do. And it's not because we can't study those genes. It's not because we don't know how to study those genes. It's because it's safer for academic scientists to study the genes that we already know something about. And so that suggests that there's a great opportunity for bold scientists and engineers like the ones that we have at Duke to go and use the technology that we've developed to understand these 6,000 genes um, and, and make new discoveries about how to treat disease. But that only explains the rest of this 2% of the genome. And actually, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You might have been asking the question, well, what is this other 98% of the genome that, doing if it's not encoding for genes? Well, so for a long time, you might have heard of the term junk DNA. We thought that the rest of that DNA sequence between our genes was just some kind of buffer or a byproduct of evolution. And we know now that that's not the case. We have about 20,000 genes, and, and those are the, the, the parts of our genome that do most of the work. Those are like the light bulbs. But it turns out that this other 98% between the genes is really quite important in dialing the level of those genes up or down. And there's actually about 2 million different regions between these 20,000 genes that act as the dimmer switches that control uh, these, these light bulbs. And so what are those dimmer switches doing? Well, they actually function through what's called epigenetics, the chemical modification of DNA, and the packaging and unpackaging of DNA to control which genes are controlled uh, and which genes are made at which level at any given time, at any given part of our body or in any given cell type. 
Well, so how do we know that these dimmer switches are important? Well, one of the ways that we know is by sequencing many human genomes. So a very simple idea was that if we now can easily and, and quickly and cheaply sequence the human genome, we should be able to take thousands of people with a particular disease and thousands of people without that disease, sequence their genomes, and compare them against each other. And any gene sequences or genome sequences that are enriched in the patients with the disease must explain uh, what is causing the disease and the disease mechanism. So this has been done for thousands of different studies across many different classes of disease, which are divided up in this pie chart here. The good news is that in all of these studies, they found sequences in the genome that were specifically enriched in the patients with disease. So that's great news. We should be able to take those, those differences between those genomes, look back into the genome, and it should tell us exactly which gene is responsible for that disease. Maybe it could be a new drug target. However, when they then map those sequences back to the genome, once again, they don't fall within the genes. They actually fall within these dimmer switches, the regulatory elements between the genes that dial those genes up or down. And when you think about the most common types of diseases, not like the disease that, that we heard about uh, from, from Priya's presentation, where there's a devastating early effect, but more common disease like cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative conditions, these are not something where it's a defined genetic condition that is inherited. It's through your genetics push you a little bit out of balance where over decades of life and environmental factors make you more or less susceptible to certain diseases. And this junk DNA, that, as it was used to be called, contains um, not just the, uh, the genetic regulation that dictates susceptibility to disease, but also the differences between us that dictate how we respond to different drugs, and also different inherited traits, things like height, body mass, even different aspects of, of other types of behaviors. So if we know about this 93% of the genome that is, uh, or 93% of the genetic variation that is responsible for all of these different classes of diseases, why don't we just go take advantage of that information to make new drugs? And again, the problem is that we don't have the technology to shine the light on those regions of the genome. And what, these are the parts of the genome, these dimmer switches between the genes where the light is dimmest. And so what we've been focusing on at Duke as a group, a, a team of different faculty, is to develop the technology that will allow us to go and shine the light on these different parts of the genome and allow us to better understand and then eventually treat these diseases. And this team has come together because of a, a property that I think is, is really unique to Duke and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with in its ability to uh, attract and recruit faculty that work across boundaries and work together in a collaborative way uh, in an interdisciplinary fashion. And I think that in many cases, it's not necessarily the case that faculty were hired to work together, but I think that Duke hires the type of faculty that find each other and want to work together. And I want to highlight one example of this in this area of genomic technology development. Development. So Greg Crawford is a faculty member in pediatrics, and he is a, an expert. He developed the technology to go in and map all of the open, closed, open and closed parts of the genome, and he's done this now across hundreds of different human cell and tissue types to map millions of different dimmer switches or regulatory elements across the genome. Tim Reddy was independently hired into bioinformatics and biostatistics, and his background is in developing the methods um, to go in and quantify the activity of every single one of those dimmer switches once Greg's technology has gone and mapped where they're all located. Work in my lab over the last 10 years has developed tools based on things like CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology, but not to change underlying DNA sequence, but rather to go in and turn these dimmer switches up or down to better understand which genes they're controlling in the genome and what their function is. Uh, Chris Wood was independently hired into pharmacology, and, and he's been pioneering methods to combine drug screens with these types of genetic screens to be able to pair actual uh, pharmacologic treatment with the types of uh, genetic discoveries that we're making. And Mir Maria Cifani was independently hired into immunology, where she's been applying these tools to better understand the mechanisms and potential treatment of autoimmune disease. And so collectively, we've all independently developed different technologies and disease expertise to go in and and, and apply this to illuminating this dark matter of the human genome. And in the last couple of minutes, I, I wanna just give you some examples of specific disease areas where this team uh, has made some impact. Uh, I mentioned that Greg had developed these different technologies for going and mapping open and closed regions across the genome. Most recently, he applied that to hundreds of human brain tissue samples from schizophrenia patients to go in and discover different regions of the genome that are specifically differentially regulated between schizophrenia brain, human brain samples and control. 
Um, that's leading to new understanding of the mechanism of these diseases, which we really uh, do not real, uh, understand the, the fundamental cause of. Uh, Tim Reddy is applying his technology for understanding the activity of all of these millions of regulatory elements across the genome to better understand how differences in individuals dictate uh, different drug responses. One of the ways that he's applied this is the most commonly used drug in the world, which are cortisone and its derivatives. Probably many of you in the audience have used some form of uh, cortisol-derived drugs or different creams for things like inflammation or itch uh, at, at different times. And he's applied his techniques across the genome uh, in what is the most comprehensive evaluation of any drug treatment uh, ever at the molecular level. And what you're seeing here is uh, each column in, uh, in this first uh, panel on the left is taking samples every single hour for 12 hours after drug treatment. And every single row, the very thin rows um, on the left there is a different gene and how it's changing. The color indicates how it's changing in response to drug treatment. And then on the right is many different courses, uh, many different chemical modifications to these uh, regulatory elements or dimmer switches across the genome. And so through this type of study, he's now sequenced the human genome many hundreds of times over, building on that first $3 billion human genome project to understand the differences in genetic variation that drive response to disease. As I mentioned, my lab's really been focused on how do we go in and directly perturb the activity of these regulatory elements in living cells to understand what their function is and how they change cell and, and organism behavior. And so we've been using these CRISPR technologies but modifying them so they don't change underlying DNA sequence, but rather just dial the dimmer switches up or down. And we've done this in a variety of studies, but to give one example is using these tools to go in and control the levels of genes that dictate cholesterol turnover. And so we were able to design CRISPR tools that we could uh, deliver into the liver of mice and use these to change the dimmer switches to lower overall cholesterol levels, which could potentially one day be a type of form of, uh, of treatment for cardiovascular disease. And in fact, the data that was generated up here uh, uh, on this slide um, was, was generated by a, a student of mine who's now in the audience, uh, Miss Pratiksha, or Dr. Pratiksha Takor. And so I, I'd really appreciate it if everyone could help me embarrass her with a round of applause for, uh, which I think she, she's definitely earned with the fantastic work uh, that, that she's done at Duke and has now joined uh, the Boston Alumni Network. So just to, to finish up, Chris Wood has really been focused on how does he pair these types of genetic screens with deciding which is the right drug treatment to di treat different forms of cancer. And this is a set of data that he uh, generated where every row is a different cancer type. Every column is a different genetic perturbation that he's created. And the color in every intersection dictates how well these cancers responded to a certain drug. And so this is allowing us to better assign drug treatments for different cancers. And and then Maria's work has really been in uh, moving back and forth between human disease and mouse models in order to better understand um, the, uh, the role of immune cells in autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis. And so this spider web up here on the, on the uh, right is an example of the gene network that she has then mapped out using these types of technologies to help us better understand how our immune systems are dysregulated in these types of diseases. And then uh, in, in the final slides, I want to mention that between this group of investigators, we've, we really take very seriously uh, our, our responsibility to move these discoveries and these technologies back to benefits for human health, even though what I'm presenting to you is very basic science. And uh, we, across the, the group of us, have taken millions of taxpayer dollars through NIH funding to do our work. And in order to try and translate that back into uh, medicines that will help individuals, we actually formed, a, this group of faculty formed a company a couple of years ago to help us Establish that platform. And it, our ability to go and form this company um, locally in Durham, North Carolina, was really driven by the support that is part of the unique innovation and entrepreneurship environment that is um, being cultivated at Duke. And we really took advantage of, of a number of different resources at Duke and also in the local Durham, North Carolina area. But I'll just mention at the bottom that really our, our greatest um, asset that we had in this whole thing was our students. And in fact, when we started the 
this company. Uh, the first seven employees into the company were our former students and trainees. And I think that um, of all of the things that we've done during our time at Duke, I think our, our, our most rewarding experience was when our students had graduated, they could have gone and done anything in the world, and they choose to stay at Duke and, or stay in Durham and work with us um, in taking their inventions and deliver it into benefits for, uh, for, for patients. And, and we moved into this area of, of starting this company um, with a lot of trepidation. So we're very nervous in our first venture um, out of academia and in industry. Uh, we had the hypothesis that what we were doing was very important and that taking these technologies out into uh, industry and helping the pharmaceutical industry develop drugs was going to be very important. But, but that's not that surprising. Professors always think what they're doing is important. So, so the question was, did anyone else think it was important? And we were really uh, reassured when within the, just a few months after we had started this company, uh, one of the top 30 pharmaceutical companies in the world had come in and, and wanted to acquire us to, to incorporate it into its drug development pipeline. We were originally very nervous about this, uh, um, but we realized that, that working with them was going to accomplish all of the goals that we had set out to accomplish. And that was that we wanted to keep this company in North Carolina, we wanted to move um, our technology out into the real world, and we wanted to employ our students and give them some new job opportunities. Um, and in fact, that has all continued to be the case where more than a year later, this global pharmaceutical company has now got its functional genomics hub of 25 employees in downtown uh, Durham, just down the road from Duke University. And then finally, we've been very uh, uh, pleased to see that the Duke recognizes this tremendous opportunity to apply this technology and getting the return on the investment that it's made in these relatively junior faculty that are um, making these advances. And as a result, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that this spring we're launching a new center at Duke, uh, the Duke Center for Advanced Genomic Technologies, that is going to do more of what we just described, of, of taking this approach to explore the unannotated parts of the human genome and illuminate uh, the dark matter. And we're doing that not just with the group of five faculty that I uh, have highlighted here, but really many different faculty interested in gene regulation across all different components of campus. And, and so the goal in summary is to really take this new technology that we've developed at Duke to unlock this dark matter or, or, uh, of the genome and use those discoveries to develop new treatments and new strategies for many different types of diseases. Thank you for your time, and I hope I uh, can answer a few of your questions. Fantastic. Thank you. So, once again, we have a great opportunity to uh, talk with Charlie. Remember, when you ask a question, identify yourself and your affiliation. And, and while you're thinking, uh, let me just pose you a quick question. I noticed on your slide, Charlie, um, Element Genomics is continuing to work in the Chesterfield building. That's right. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the geography or history of Durham, the Chesterfield building is the Liggett and Meyer building. In its day, the building that produced uh, more cigarettes than any other building in the world. And uh, it, uh, when tobacco left town, it, it was vacated. It stood empty for 20 years. And just last year, was relaunched uh, as a fabulous innovation hub. About a third of it Duke engineers, about a third of it startup companies, and about a third smaller, medium-sized companies. And I, I found it amazing that a building that produced more cigarettes than any other building in the world might be the place where we discover a cure for cancer, yeah. which I think is awesome. Um, but in your time, you've been at Duke about 10 years now. How have you seen that environment, that sort of innovation environment, uh, change in Durham? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been fantastic. I, I didn't have time. I had a list of bullet points of kind of the different sources of support that we had. It's something that you know we had kind of talked about doing, but really didn't have the time or the knowledge which to do ourselves. And really, it was the other leaders at Duke that came and gave us a kick in the butt and told us, you're going to do this one way or another. Uh, by the end of the day, you're going to have a company. If you don't have a name, I'm going to name it for you. And, and it was partly because we had been supported by things like the Duke Coulter Translational Partnership 
which has been um, endowed at Duke with the mission of translating those technologies out into industry. And so with that type of support where they basically held our hand along the way with helping us go and, and start the company um, and, uh, and then get the company funded through things like a Duke Entrepreneur in Residence, uh, the fantastic Tech Transfer Office, the Duke Office of Licensing Adventures, working with them was very easy. But I think the best part about it has been, um, and I think what made it, what gave us the courage to go and do it was that the students and the postdocs in the lab uh, wanted to go and do this with us. And I think that's what gave us the confidence because we knew these people, we knew that they were exceptionally talented, we knew that whatever they did, they were gonna be successful at. If we just had to go hire people off the street, I don't think we would have had the courage to do it. So I think that these Duke students that are, are bold and they wanna go and start companies and be involved in something risky, but maybe do something important, was really the activation energy that, that got us going. Fantastic. Questions for Charlie? There, it's a quiet crowd. Yes, we have a question down here in the front. We can run a mic over. Alex Van Dyke, Trinity 07, Fuqua 13. How do you view the relationship between academia and biopharma, and is there any room for improvement? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, so I'm sure there's always room for improvement. I mean, I do think that there's a lot of interesting things going on right now with how biotech, um, and maybe more biotech than biopharma, but, but I think both are helping support work that's going on in academia. Um, in my lab alone, we have uh, research support from four different biotech companies. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's just one example. And some of those are local to North Carolina, and some of those are, you know, some of them are here in Boston, some of them are elsewhere. So I think that, um, you know, that, that's great that we can get that type of support. And I think there's, uh, there's certainly room for improvement, though. I think that um, it's a difficult situation to navigate, and everyone's always very busy. So I think that, um, I think there could probably be more education of academics of how to work with, with biotech and biopharma, um, I think that would um, allow more relationships and more productive relationships, because I think a lot of academics don't see that as a possibility and don't know that they can go and do that. I also think that uh, academics can be better educated so they're not taken advantage of by, by industry is probably another aspect of that. But um, I think it, my impression is that the relationship is strengthening in terms of the amount of R&D that is being outsourced to academia uh, you know, for, for good or bad, but I think it is uh, spurring innovation. Uh, right here in, in, in the front, yeah. Um, Robert Brandt, um, Electrical Engineering 1980. I was just wondering, is, was the value of your company, Element Genomics, was it the intellectual property or were they buying the expertise of the people in the company? Yeah, that probably depends who you ask, but um, uh, you know, but I think that it was, it was largely the expertise, I would say it's largely the expertise, right? And I think that that probably uh, you know, you know, holds up under, under uh, inspection, which is also, I think, partly why they came in so early for, for an acquisition, right? But I think that, um, I, I didn't mention this in response to the biopharma question, but one of the other things that got us up and going to form this company was that we were being approached by, so many, by many different pharmaceutical companies wanting to work with us because they saw a talk at a meeting or, or they saw a published paper. And they said, well, we want to um, take your technology and apply it to what we do. And we had a couple of companies approach us for that. And some of these things are interesting scientifically, and some of them are not. Some of them are just turning the wheel. And that was partly when we decided that maybe some of this belonged in a company where a, pharma a large pharmaceutical company could come in and take advantage of our expertise in a more direct way um, that's kind of outside academic research. And I think, I think that was the value and I think that held up. Uh, yes, question here, Laura. Thanks so much, Charlie. Question at hand is the relationship with alums. And is, uh, Laura Wellman, sorry, Trinity 73, parent 11. And is there a connection back to our alumni population that in any way helps other than philanthropy, but in connecting back into this kind of work and the work that you are doing? What is the reach out or connections that you form? 
Sure, I think there's a couple of different ways. I mean, of course, um, philanthropic research support is always appreciated, and then that helps us to, to reach into areas that are otherwise difficult by traditional means. But we've also greatly benefited in terms of some of the entrepreneurship and translational efforts by interacting with our alums. One of the things on the bullet point list that we got support from was a Duke Entrepreneur in Residence program. The entrepreneur in residence that we worked with was in fact a Duke alum who had had a long and, and um, productive career uh, in venture capital, came back to Durham to retire, but was pulled out of retirement uh, in order to come work with us to help steer a bunch of academics with really no concept of how to successfully start a company um, and, uh, and, and, and help us al along that path. And so, uh, and, and it was actually an extended network of, of Duke alumni that, that helped us with that. So I think that maybe part of the the answer to the question of how can this process be improved um, by better educating faculty, I think that our alumni are a great resource for that education. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a question over here. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Alex Fott, Fuqua 2016. You talked about some of the other faculty that you're working with in this project, and then you mentioned on the last side in the new center um, a partnership with Arts and Science, and I was wondering if you could just speak to what their role is in that team and how they'll function. Yeah, so um, some of this is still being defined in, in, in real time. This is something that we're in the middle of, of launching now. But I think that there are a number of different faculty across all, you know, across arts and sciences, engineering, and medicine that have all independently and together developed these types of technologies for understanding how our genome functions and applied those findings to better understanding disease and, and how to treat those diseases. So some of that is from the science standpoint, but there's other aspects of this as well. So for example, um, you know, working with the business school to help translation of these types of technologies is, is something that we hope to do. Um, we've also been engaging with the health policy experts uh, at Duke down in uh, Washington, D.C. that are helping us better understand how some of these new technologies may eventually be regulated as some of the things that we're doing get closer uh, to the FDA. And then there's also an ethical component to this. I, you know, I, most of what I focused on was more on the basic side, but you know, some of the th uh, new types of medicines that are being developed, like modification, targeted modification of genome sequences, have ethical components associated with them, and so some of the social sciences uh, can, can help us um, navigate that as well. Well, this and is also help inform the public. This is fantastic work, and uh, please join me again in thanking Charlie Gerspach. <laughs>